We, uh, there was a talk that was uh, proposed called Proxy Ham, where um, the idea was to put a, a little box, hide it near a bar or a, a Starbucks, and to tap into their Wi-Fi, and then use a, a long distance point-to-point -point link in order to then tap in remotely from many miles away to that bar's uh, Wi-Fi network. And that was then canceled under mysterious circumstances. And no one knows why. It's probably the FCC got uh, mad because maybe he was uh, boosting his signal where he wasn't supposed to or something like that. Um, so we offered, since we've done research in this area, we offered to do uh, a replacement talk for that. Uh, first of all, how it would work and how it appears that he, he, um, he did his point-to-point -point link. And then uh, why it actually is easy for the FCC to, to actually catch you and find your location, um, which is probably how he got caught. And then other other strategies that you can use to accomplish the same sort of thing, but in ways that it's unlikely that the FCC will catch you or even want to come after you for for causing electrical disturb disturbances. So what we have here is a um, just the basic devices of if you wanted to create a point to point link to a very remote location, how you would do it. So to start with, we have um, a ubiquity device. This is a hundred twenty five dollar device. Yeah. Uh, it's one end of the point to point link. So, so just so I'm clear, because uh, Ubiquity, I know, is the company that's uh, broadcasting over wireless spectrum in a certain range? Right. They they sell a bunch of devices that, depending upon the spectrum, will be a slightly different device. Okay. Uh, this one's 900 megahertz. Uh, there are several bands in radio frequencies that are allowed for unlicensed communication. They do whatever you want with, which is what the Wi-Fi band is at 2.4 gigahertz. There's another band at 5 gigahertz. And this is the lower band at 900 megahertz. 900 megahertz is attractive because, first of all, it doesn't have all the Wi-Fi interference of 2.4 gigahertz, uh, but also because it, it goes longer distances, mm -hmm. basically, and deals with obstructions better. And also, while people have a lot of tools to uh, sniff and analyze Wi-Fi uh, emanations, mm -hmm. uh, there really isn't any uh, for 900 megahertz. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only ones that we've been able to find were actually made by uh, the same company, Ubiquity. They're made for uh, testing diagnostic purposes. But you know, with Wi-Fi tools, you can uh, Cali, the pen testing framework, is loaded with them. Mm -hmm. All you need is a dongle to, to find it. So our theory was that the, uh, the original proxy, uh, proxy ham author thought that because it won't be on 2.4, it would be on 900 megahertz, that it would provide a, a little more layer of security because people wouldn't be thinking to look Because it's more obscure. Security by obscurity. Um, right, and we know that security by obscurity is bad, and that's probably what happened with him is that he was boosting the signal at 900 megahertz and the FCC came after him. And the FCC actually is really, really good at finding people who cause interference on, in radio waves and tracking them down. They've got little vans in every city that they can run on by and with the directional antennas and then find find things. You know, so they, they, don't, uh, they don't take kindly to people causing what uh, interference to other bands, especially since a 900 megahertz band on either side is bookended by cellular. Okay. Like the 850, yeah. uh, which is like the center, which goes all the way up uh, to 8, 890. Uh, and then the 900, uh, which uh, so about 930. Yeah, goes up, yeah. So you, they would actually be... Uh, it's really uh, easy to, to interfere with the, the cellular traffic. So, um, so anyway, so 900 megahertz point-to-point -point link. So here we have two devices connected by Ethernet, one of which is the link, uh, the remote link, and then one of which is just a little Wi-Fi device. And this would be the Wi-Fi client. You would connect to this. There's you know, connecting the Ethernet to your laptop, and you have a little web page there. This is a, a travel router. It's just a normal Wi-Fi router. But most Wi-Fi routers have the ability to also be a client, which means this would, instead of accepting incoming connections, would create an outgoing connection to someone else's Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And presumably, we would take these two things, plug them into the to a wall socket uh, for power or battery, if we wanted, um, and then ha configure this device to connect to a bar's Wi-Fi network or a Starbucks or a hotel's Wi-Fi network, some some public Wi-Fi. Sure. And set this up out of the way, but where this has line of sight to you, so you can connect to it. Um, Miles away. Now, consumer devices, uh, call this a consumer device, usually have a standard repeater or even bridge. Is that what, what's, what's right. taking use of here? This would be like the standard bridge mode or okay. repeater mode um, or client mode. Okay. The, the real 
the trick is that you're using the non 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Well, this is using the, the non 2.4 right. gigahertz. Right. This is using the 2.4 gigahertz. This is the Wi Fi part. And then from a. Uh, and that's Ethernet between us, it's Ethernet packets. Yeah. Now, if the packets are received at the other end, it's the, it has the IP of the source, which was the bar or whatever, and there may not have been anything in the packet header or stream right. to indicate There's that it had been that, transmitted right. over a distance or otherwise. Right, so this, what, you're, what you're really doing is you're taking one set of problems where somebody could easily find you uh, by finding the IP address um, and sub, uh, subpoenaing the logs or whatnot of the, of the location. So you're trading the uh, anonymity, basically, of the packets for a very direct, uh, basically, line of bearing with the radios. Like So while you're kind of getting rid of one problem, you're building an even bigger problem. Yeah, it's often easier to find people for the radio signals. Mm -hmm. So this was $125 for this device, mm -hmm. and then this was $25. So $150 plus the Ethernet cable. Uh, but so you, so you then you, on Amazon. then you need but then you need another one of these on the other end. Sure. And so that's why I show here is you have another of these devices that you would point at that device, and then it's just connected to my laptop. Sure. So for example, maybe there's a hill overlooking the town. So yeah. you set this up with the bar pointed vaguely towards the hill, and then you drive up to the hill, pull out your laptop, and start hacking, and you're like five miles away. And you can establish a, a pretty good connection of, of three of three megabits per second, um, six megabits per second. I could get six megabits per second between these two devices. So they advertise five or ten or even twenty miles. Really, depending on the, the hardware. You, the, the biggest issue is the line of sight. Okay. Is that um, there's a couple of issues. First of all, if it's near the ground, there's um, it's called the Fresno effect okay. that can cause interference. So you, you want I, if you were to do it ideally. In a real world situation where you really cared about radio, you would put them on towers fairly far above the ground, yeah. uh, and where they can see each other directly. So that if, sure. you, if you were to like take your mic, your binoculars, you can see the other side. But 900 megahertz is also really good resistant for um, construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually will go through buildings depending upon the building materials, and it will go through trees, um, and it it, it, it will go. F through that stuff better yeah. than other frequencies would. Now, I know these are just, uh, for lack of a better term, the base station, they're not really base stations. Is there a need, right. where's the antenna piece, or is that oh, integrated? Oh, so the antenna piece, they, so ubiquitous is just built in all in one device. Okay. This is what's called a panel antenna, and a panel antennas are directional. On the back here, they have a full connector for a pole, yeah. that's why it's a little round, and they, they just take string and wrap it around the pole, like you mount it on a pole, and then this is then would be the directional panel okay. antenna. So the, um, so frequencies on the on the like over here it, uh, on the on the sort of the size would be received very well, but the ones directly in front are the ones that are received very well. So as opposed to uh, proxy ham, where initial images showed this, you know, eight foot or X foot, they use uh, a Yagi antenna, not which, necessary, or uh, there's just um, another option. If you I guess. want to go further, it's necessary. Or okay. get a stronger signal to get higher data rates, it's necessary. But on the other hand, it's also probably exceeding FCC limits. Okay. But it looks really hackerish. Uh, so does. talking about FCC limits and keeping within the bounds of uh, federal regulations and whatever state we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about this type of boosting, would that be within the regulations theoretically, I guess, or it not? It appears so. The regulations state things like if you take three feet away in front of it, the signal strength has to be less than something. I forget the exact signal strength. Okay. And that appears to be the specs of this device, that, that, this, that actually it matches. So it appears that this was engineered specifically to be right at that limit. Got it. And then no stronger. And they do have an external antenna here that you can add to it to, to get like a Yagi directional thing. But the documentation clearly says that, well, only a licensed professional should add the antenna there because they're going to likely exceed FCC regulations. Fair so enough. the documentation is very clear. Uh, it's okay to use it in the normal defaults, but if you start right. tweaking things, you have to start getting licenses and stuff. Good. This is an interesting thing. I actually got my ham radio license just to do this talk. Well, you were getting it anyway, but... That's well, interesting. No, I, 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 um, aside from, eventually. Aside from you know, probably uh, answering a few questions, what's involved in getting a ham radio license because I'm unaware? You have to take uh, three exams, yeah. uh, the technical, the general, and the extra. The technical gives you access to a certain uh, number of bands uh, and operating modes. Yep. The general gives you some more. The extra gives you uh, access to everything that the, uh, the FCC uh, licenses amateurs for. 
Fantastic. So I knocked all three out. Uh, so, but the other one, the thing we're really going to demo is um, uh, how easy it is to find. Yes. Yeah. Just that, that, because you're far away doesn't mean you're high. And okay. I, I've got a picture I can send you. Okay. So that um, these things create really strong signals. Yeah. And they, uh, they're they really easy to detect. So one of the popular things these days is what's called SDR, Software Defined Rebel Radio. radio yeah. Where uh, you have these little devices that where your, your uh, laptop or your computer does most of the signal processing and all the, the SDR does or the, the device does is read the signal. Yeah. And then you do all the complicated processing on your laptop. And that allows us to craft signals to do interesting things that would, in days past would have taken hardware. It would cost you, you know, a million dollars to create this advanced hardware to do yeah. this. We can just write a little program in code sure. and code and whip it out in a, in a few hours. And so we've created some, some code that we're playing with that um, to craft. So normally when you do radio communications, it's a, you have a very narrow band mm -hmm. uh, that's with a, with a strong signal strength. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's narrow but big, but you can do the same sort of thing of just instead of tall, you can do a very wide band. So you're, you're sending what we're going to do is send across the entire 900 megahertz range, um, but at a very low signal strength. And uh, so instead of going taller, you go taller, you're going wider. Um, and because it's not a strong signal strength, it's really hard to pick that up uh, over the background signals because. All radio uh, frequency ranges have this background, it's called the noise floor, mm -hmm. and it comes from solar radiation or other terrestrial man-made devices. If you uh, just look at a frequency range, it's just noise constantly. Yeah. It's kind of like when you tune your radio, if you turn up the volume, you hear static. That's what it is. So when your signal is just barely audible above the static, and you use a wide range, not just like one, like the radio station, not just one, mm -hmm. but just the whole frequency range. Um, you, it's really hard for them, unless they knew exactly what you're doing, it's hard for the FCC to prove you're even transmitting it at all because okay. you're not above that static layer. So if, it, let's assume that this was just, uh, uh, is that 900 megahertz link in between the two devices, that encrypted in any way or benefit from the WPA2 or whatever? Yes, what it is, which is an interesting thing. Uh, if you look online and look what, what parts are in these things, um, it's actually almost the same chipset in both this Wi-Fi device and this yeah. 900 megahertz device. The only difference between this device and this Wi-Fi device is there's what's called, well, I actually don't know what it's called, I think it's called a block converter. It takes the 2.4 gigahertz range yeah. um, and shifts it, just does a shift down to the 900 megahertz range. So it thinks it's a Wi-Fi device running at 2.4 gigahertz. And this there's is a little extra hardware attached to the radio yeah. that says, no, we're going to shift the whole address, the, the frequencies down. As with the and this megahertz. is functionality built in, so no magic required. No magic. Right. Okay. So that, that's why this technology perspective, uh, rather than calling it proxy ham, what would you call this? What would the proper well, name for a setup like this be? Well, we're calling our setup of the, uh, the ham sandwich. Okay. But in reality, it's just a it's just off-the-shelf equipment. It's Got it. It's a, it's a wireless bridge. Um, and then for uh, aside from monitoring physical uh, taps on their network, because that's what it looks like, uh, or a device that's in their network that's broadcasting something that shouldn't, what else could they do to limit risk? Uh, you scan the, uh, the frequency ranges and look for uh, unintended emissions. So if you saw a 900, you would know that's probably not supposed yeah, to be actually, there. Actually, that is something that, that hackers often do, is they will walk into an organization and just drop off a little device like this yeah. and walk out. And then so go sit in the parking lot. It's just 2.4 as an access point, yeah. but connected the Ethernet to their network. And just walk out, sit in the parking lot, and just start reading all the data from the network. There's just ready off to make, uh, ready off yourself tools to buy. So one of the things that you can do with like advanced Wi-Fi systems like Cisco is they will actually scan for other devices to see sure. if someone has added like a 2.4 gigahertz yeah. device yeah, on clean air or whatever they call it. I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that only covers 2.4. Right? Yeah, but one of these is a $125 device that can do the identical thing, but at 900 megahertz, where they don't monitor. Okay. So you'd really need a tool to monitor basically everything else. And, but, but using one of these things where the, now that as a hacker, I can control pretty much any frequency. Um, it's really impractical to scan all frequencies. They could. Um, uh, and maybe it would be a useful thing for them to do, but 
um, yeah, we could just put this on their network and, and just choose start choosing random like uh, you know like the same radio frequencies that FM radios use or something sure. like that. It's illegal as hell, but of course I'm a hacker, so I'm doing illegal stuff anyway. <laughs> Fair um, and then uh, just start you know, pulling out all the data. And then from the flip side, whether it's HackRF or one of these other tools here, could I, uh, an organization use that to monitor all these different spectrums? Yes. Well, well, that's actually what we're going to show is how the original proxy ham setup was flawed because you can easily really detect the, uh, the signal. Because it was on a uh, line of sight 900? Right. Okay. Well, because now, it was so powerful. Right. And too, too powerful. Right. So then okay. once you detect it, you can use a directional antenna to follow it right back to the source. So you've actually gotten away with nothing and actually added a additional crime on top of whatever else you were doing. Truth was. Good. Well, well uh, looking at the picture, that's kind of surprised. Oh, they're just using off-the-shelf equipment. Why are they building things? Like, why are they using a Raspberry Pi to connect to the Wi-Fi when you just can just grab any Wi-Fi router and connect? Yeah. So this is $25, which is cheaper than the Raspberry Pi. So just use one of these things rather than go through the complicated thing of Say for Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So there's a quick backlash on Twitter when the when the talk was was originally sure. canceled, uh, and there, the theories ran wild. It, it was you know the government forced it being canceled because of security reasons or whatnot. But we're going to you know, our goal was really to show that uh, it actually did not enhance security. It did the exact opposite. You end up causing more trouble than you fix.